Welcome to the Sailing into Oblivion podcast, where we sit down with everyday people who do extraordinary things. I'm your host, Jerome Rand. Good afternoon. Welcome to the show. Today, we have a great conversation. Uh, I was able to, because I'm on the road, I'm able to bump into quite a few uh, of my old friends, and I got to sit down with not only a friend, but also kind of a mentor uh, that I met long ago in the days of Bitter End. And uh, John and I, essentially, he would come down for special events, big regattas, most notably the Pro-Am regatta, where some of the America's Cup skippers, around the world racers, all these sort of big names would come down and join our guests for a week of match racing and uh, fleet racing, big boat racing, small boats, all this sort of stuff. It was an absolute blast, and John sort of helped guide me through the world of that. Um, you know, me, I'm sort of a cruiser, a solo guy. Um, always just uh, never really got too much into racing, but it is a fascinating, fascinating part of the sport, and I think it's uh, it's well worth diving into. And the nice part with John is he's been in the thick of it for a very long time. And not that he's an old man by any means. Uh, it's just that he's... He started early and he stayed with it, and so uh, it was great to get some of his insights and uh, some of his stories about, I don't know, the evolution of how things have changed since the 80s and uh, all of that. So it was really, really cool, and we also, he's a yacht broker here in Connecticut and got into some of that information as well, and just an all-around fantastic uh, friend of mine. So big thanks to John for spending a little bit of his valuable time with me the other day and sharing it with everybody. But before I start the show, like I always say, if you want to help support the Sailing Into Oblivion podcast, keep it on the air, keep it going, and possibly help support Sparrow getting things like new sails and new gear, safe stuff to keep uh, the adventures uh, alive in the future. Consider possibly becoming one of the 52 strong Patreon family that helps support this show. Big, big thanks to all of you and all of the listeners in general. But those who are uh, actually part of that, you're definitely making a huge difference. So I really, really appreciate it. Follow the link in the description for that. Obviously, we still have the old merch line. I am working on hopefully getting up to Maine at some point. And uh, if that does happen, we're going to do a little photo shoot. I'm going to get myself a nice shot of Murph so that I can get the Murph Oracle t-shirt out. I got to get that line out. I really, really want to. I know people have been asking for it, so I think it's got to happen and uh, it's well worth the little trip up to Maine to go and not only do a podcast, but also get uh, get him on one of these shirts. Uh, follow the link in the description for all the ones we have out now. And then if you just want to reach out to the show, feel free, sailingintooblivion.com. Those emails, when uh, you follow the podcast button, go to the contact the show. Those will go directly to me, and I always try and get to them. And respond as best as I can. So without further ado, here's my conversation with John Glenn. We're recording. Welcome to the show, John. Uh, top notch. Happy I, to be on. Thanks I, for having me. <laughs> I can't, I Looks can't like, tell you how much I appreciate it. I, I always tell people that though, because it's it really is like you're giving me your time. No, this is Which great. Is it's, our, it's good to see you. I mean, it's been a while. It's, I know. It's, it's, we it. get to I'm sort of catch up. Looking forward to that part of it, too. Yeah, no, for sure. Well, I'm one of the, I, I've always found one of the nice parts about doing this is that I, you get this sort of uninterrupted conversation where I can like, because, you know, I hate to say it, but all these years that I've known you, I don't know how you ever even got into sailing. Like where you cut your teeth and everything. Oh, uh, great question. So... Grew up in Larchmont originally uh, and sailed at Larchmont Yacht Club. My parents weren't sailors, but they enrolled me in the junior program there and uh, sailed in little dire dows, uh, little tiny bathtubs as, a, as an eight and nine year old. Those were the precursors in those days to Optimus. Optimus didn't really exist in those days. So yeah. Sailed those, and then our family moved to uh, to Greenwich, Connecticut, just up uh, Long Island Sound from Larchmont. Got into sailing there again. My parents didn't sail, but they saw it as a lifetime sport, so they thought, "Hey, you might enjoy this." And I took to it pretty quickly at a young age. Yeah, 
And it, it's got to keep you a little bit out of trouble, too. It kept me a little bit out of trouble. <laughs> it also got me into a little bit of trouble, happily, but good, good, good trouble. There, there are days when, you know, friends and I look back on it and say, how did we survive to this day, given what we went through in those days? Well, and that's part of it, you know, like I always say, cutting your teeth, because, I mean, sometimes you actually do break some bones and uh, get some cuts and scrapes, but that's how you learn. Yeah. At least that's how I've always exactly. learned. Exactly. And in those days, you know, people didn't have personal flotation devices, or as we called them, life jackets. They weren't a big part of the sailing regiment. Thank God they are nowadays. But yeah. uh, in those days, we didn't think about it very much. It was the 70s, and you know, people just sort of went, hey, where's my OP shorts and my T-shirt? And that was about all you went sailing. <laughs> yeah, right. And look, may, not even sunscreen. In not that even sunscreen. Maybe some of that that nose stuff. Uh, a zinc, zinc, a little nose zinc. A little that, zinc was, yeah. that, was, that was about it. And uh, it was very funny. Yes, Just yesterday, I posted something on uh, on my Instagram account about the type of wristwatches we were wearing in the 1970s because when I first started sailing wristwatches for sailing didn't exist you wore a stopwatch on a lanyard around your neck oh, for it the was start sequence that, yeah. for the start sequence for sailboat racing and uh, you know the digital age hadn't really come come around yet Timex was just transitioning to the digital digital age so there was a watch company called memo sail which was the very first maker of start timers for sailboat races do you still have one i do not though it's it, <laughs> oh, my, my my post pointed out that i the one i bought in 1976 i believe it was uh is on one like it is on ebay today for 1490 dollars no way wow which certainly sparked a lot of people on my instagram feed and my facebook feed to say darn i wish i had kept mine <laughs> <laughs> yeah i'll bet because how much did they go for when they were out it was 90 bucks back then that oh, was, was a, that was bucks. a brand new one 90 dollars. you could get what they called the vip memo sale for 110 dollars, which had a little bit more stainless steel or something i just made it look a little bit flashier but the the stock one was 90 bucks and now on ebay 1400 and some odd dollars yeah yeah <laughs> holy smokes so, that's yeah. amazing how some of that stuff just ups its value is uh it's crazy i mean you think about like your toy chest when you were a kid and i i can think of all those all those star wars figurines and things like that and like, yeah don't have a single one of them left. No, but if you look probably on on eBay or some of those uh, you know collectible sites, there if you if you did have them, you could probably find a home for them pretty well. Yeah, uh, right. You know, line your pockets <clears throat> a little bit. <laughs> well, the hard part though would be that you know you you would really want them still in their package, but I don't know a single kid that would ever do that. Right. Especially back in the 80s. You just never thought of it that uh, way. You but. busted the package open the second you got yeah, it. Yeah, <laughs> right? 100%. And then you, you did. You burn them with uh, magnifying glasses yeah. and all sorts of stuff. Blew them up with M80s, all kinds of stuff <laughs> yeah. like that. God, it was a glorious time to grow up, I tell you. <laughs> like I said, it's amazing that we all lived to the day we were at today, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> given, exactly. what we, given how we lived back then. Well, so when, when you went, um, obviously you started off kind of in the, the racing community, but then you started going pretty full on into it. Yeah. I mean, the, you know, as, as I, you know, progressed through it, I, I, you know, like a lot of kids in that era, uh, and today for that matter, if you enjoy it, you take, a, uh, you take on instructing, you become an instructor after you graduate from junior sailing. Yeah. And after, you know, as, as people see you on the docks as an instructor, uh, the grown-ups, as they call them, the adults in the room, will say, hey, come racing with me on my big boat. And so you cut your teeth on the big boats, um, while at the same time you sort of hold on to the, uh, maybe you, you sail in college while you're an instructor. So you're still dinghy sailing at that point. You're still traveling around. I, I went to Ohio Wesleyan University in, in the Midwest, and we had a sailing team. We were top 10 ranked most of the time I was there. We were you know, somewhere in the top 20 always, and sometimes in the top 10. Yeah. So we were traveling around. We were coming east. We were going up to your uh, your home territory, sailing Great Michigan Lakes. State. We were sailing nice. against the uh, University of Michigan. We were sailing uh, all over the Midwest. And then uh, University of Michigan was one of our biggest Midwest competitors, Michigan State as well. Dawn Riley went to Michigan State while I was uh, oh, at Ohio Wesleyan. Yeah. So I used to race against her in college. And then uh, we'd come east for all the major intersectionals, uh, at the Naval Academy or in Boston at Harvard or MIT and that sort of thing. 
So we were sailing a lot, racing a lot in college. But What were you then, racing on? So uh, the, the primary fleets in those days, and a lot of them are the same today, were flying juniors, mm -hmm. 420s, and lasers. If you were a single-handed sailor, you were sailing lasers. But the primary boats were the double-handed boats, uh, and that was flying juniors and 420s. In Boston, you'd sail tech dinghies. You'd sail uh, interclub dinghies. There's a variety of other boats you'd sail, depending on where you were going. Whoever was the home team... That's who you sail. Oh, you sail okay, their boats. Okay. If you sailed at the Naval Academy in those days, you'd sail four twenties typically. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, okay. Well, and then you know, I mean, when you and I work together, you know, with the pros doing all these yeah. pro am regattas down at Bitter End and all that. Yep. And that was, uh, I would say, that was my birth into the sort of the high end racing scene. Even though that was, you know, a, a amateur crew with a professional but it was the top elite professionals you know rubbing elbows with some of those guys like ken reed and russell and and all those guys i mean to me when you know i was so overwhelmed those first couple of years you know just i just hearing the names that i've only ever seen in magazines and yeah. stuff and you sort of came down and obviously it was old hat for you I was fortunate in that when I got out of college, um, I came out of college uh, and went to work directly for what was called Yacht Racing and Cruising Magazine in those days. It's now called Sailing World Magazine. It's well known oh, as Sailing World yeah, today. Yeah. But I was the associate editor at, uh, I started out as an editorial assistant and then rose to as associate editor at uh, what was then called Yacht Racing and Cruising, eventually became Sailing World Magazine. And that's how I got to know a lot of those those guys, while at the same time I was doing a lot of, uh, of racing uh, on the side as well, uh, whether it was J24 racing, which when you think back to it, that was a big class back then. Huge Still, class. You know, Isn't huge. that where Ken Reed was Ken sort Reed of? Ken Reed was, a, I think, a five-time world champion in the yeah. J24 class. And uh, a lot of those guys, John Coleus and John Kostecki, a lot of guys that you met at the Pro-Am, mm -hmm. uh, they they got their starts in J24s. So I sort of, I got, I wouldn't say I got my big boat start there because those aren't technically big boats, but that was sort of the, a bridge boat that took you from the college ranks to the big boats. And a lot of people use that as a transition. And that's where I got to know a lot of those folks. Plus, you know, covering them, whether it was at the SORC uh, down in Florida, uh, which was, you know, in those days, the premier uh, offshore sailboat racing regatta. And yeah, you obviously know uh, Richard Hoken very well from Bitter End. He was, uh, his boats, Love Machine 1 through 5, oh, were, uh, yeah. were perennial uh, top-notch placers on the SORC circuit. So I would, you know, I would see boats like that. And, and in latter years, uh, the one-tonners, the, uh, the two-tonners, and the bigger IOR boats would... Uh, you know, those were the ones that were hot on the scene at the SORC. So I I got to know a lot of those same guys maybe that were my age, maybe a few years older, that were racing at the highest levels in the big boats. Uh, yeah. I was covering them uh, as, as an editor, and I was racing with them wherever I got the opportunity. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, and, and that, I mean, that was what, like the, the early, mid-'80s? Early 80s, yeah. So that was still at a time, though, before sort of sailors became rock stars out of just the sailing world. I mean, I know they were inside of it, but like even the America's Cup stuff with like Ted Turner and everything, he didn't even pay any of his crew or anything. It was right. all... You're, you're absolutely right. So there, there was some, you know, a transition point. I think it was probably the mid-80s, mid to late 80s, where people like Dennis Connor and... You know, I, I credit Gary Jobson for a, a tremendous amount of bringing the sailing world into the real world, so to speak. Um, yeah. Both of them, you know, sort of dragged it kicking and screaming into the into the general uh, uh, populist knowledge. And, you know, I, I think um, I think Dennis Conner was the very first sailor ever on the cover of Time magazine. Uh, oh, really? Interesting. Ted Turner was on the cover of it, but not for sailing accomplishments. Dennis Conner was on the cover of it for sailing accomplishments. There had been plenty of sailors on the cover of Sports Illustrated over the years. Yeah. But uh, to be mainstream media, that was, I think that was 1987. Right. And that was a real turning point, I think, for the sport where everybody sat up and took notice of it. And I remember that year, the New York Times started doing a regular column 
uh, in the paper on sailing. Oh, I was like, wow, wow. Okay. didn't last long, but it, lasted <laughs> right, off, right. it went off and on for a number of years. And they still to this day carry a um, an editor who uh, it's not on their not on their masthead, but someone who is I think their. At last I remember it was Herb McCormick, but there were a number of people who had the title of New York Times sailing editor, and it was a part-time thing, obviously, well, not a full-time thing, but it, it sprung into the mainstream consciousness probably, you know, 86, 87, you know, when the when the cup was lost to Australia, which I think there was uh, uh, an anniversary of that, maybe in the 40th anniversary, um, the 45th, some some anniversary recently of yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not to, I'm trying to remember. It's re, it was just... I know it was September 6th, I think it was, because I remember watching it on a TV in my in my uh, room in college. Uh, so it must have oh, been... Oh, you were watching the race. I was watching the race on TV, uh, and it and everyone said, like, have you watching this? Are you watching this? I was like, yep, yeah, there it is. <laughs> yeah, all right. There it is. We I, lost. I kind of wonder if, if that, us losing it and sort of changing that century-long winning streak or whatever it was... Uh, maybe actually sort of helped entice more people to get into it because all of a sudden it wasn't just this thing that was always like assured like yeah obviously we're going to retain the cup and then all of a sudden we lose it so now we got a fight on our hands you know the following one and maybe a little national pride of like oh we've got to get that back sort of thing absolutely i mean the you know when when the cup went down to fremantle the amount of national pride and the number of sailors that took it as uh, you know their holy grail to go down and get it back mm-hmm. was you know that was inside the sailing community but then outside the sailing community there was a wow that's you know that's not just a sports illustrated thing anymore that's a real sport you yeah, know there yeah. was a real so i think you're right there that 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 helped put it on the map as well and again Dennis Connor and Gary Jobson were two of the key pivotal you know personalities of that of that cup and, yeah. and the cup that followed and then gary went on to be more of a commentator and more of a ambassador for the sport where dennis kept at it as a competitor and a, and a player on the you know on the uh, racing side of things didn't he do fin sailing as well or uh, what De- dennis Dennis Maybe and, that's what he started on. He might have. He might have. I, I don't know. I don't recall his exact. He was a star sailor. Uh, star. That's what it was. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I, there, there was. Uh, you know, there were a lot of racing sailors that cut their teeth in fins. There were a lot that cut their teeth in stars. There were some that cut their teeth in solings as well. well those oh three, yeah, yeah. Those yeah, three yeah. classes were really the feeders to America's Cup uh, stuff from, you know, the late 70s, 80s, and then through the, the renaissance of it in the, in the late 80s and when it really, really took off. Yeah, yeah. It is. I mean, it, it's so funny because I, I sort of, you know, I was obviously pretty into it uh, around like the BMW Oracle time because my brother Sven was working on the sales. He yep. was on that team. And, yep. and sort of that was the first real transition, I think, from – you know, the traditional 12 meter, you know, that, that sort of thing to, okay, let's see what we can build to, you know, just, just kill everybody in this thing. And, you know, (laughs) uh, that was interesting. Now, obviously they do all the foiling stuff, but there's something about when I go on YouTube and look at the old America's cup from the Dennis Connor times and stuff, cause you can watch the entire races on there, you know, it's sort of, it's a little grainy, whatever, but like, Seeing, seeing, you know, a jib sail blow out and then having to peel another one up there real fast and yep. how the boats are just, you know, charging through those waves. There's, I, even though the boats are going slower, for some reason, my palms are sweating a little more. Yeah. And I don't know if it's because it, it, to me, maybe as a monohull sailor, it's a little more relatable. Yeah. I, I think there's a very spirited debate both in the, within the sailing community and for those on the outside looking in about, you know, sort of how the America's Cup has transitioned over the last 20 years from 12 or 30, 30, 30, 40 years from 12 meters to the IACC boats, to the catamarans, to the foiling boats. Those four declensions of it have been very polarizing, I think, for people. And it, a lot of it is age related. A lot of it is people who, uh, you know, grew up watching the 12s and then grew up. Yeah, with the you IACC don't want to let it go. Boat. You don't want to let it go. 
I, you know, you know, 20, 30 years from now, you wonder if whatever two generations from now, if they're going to look back and say, oh, I'm nostalgic for those foiling boats that kept, you know, exploding and flying through the yeah, air. Yeah, yeah, right. And, and who knows where, you know, what... what the hover the boats are really great at 100 miles an hour, but... You yeah, know. <laughs> yeah. You wonder if that, that's going to be the debate 30, 40 years from now. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm of a generation that, you know, I, I liked to see the transition from the 12s to the IACC boats. I thought that was a good transition as much as I liked the 12s. Yeah. I thought that was fantastic. But then to see it to go, go to catamarans, um, uh, it lost its purity to me for some reason. I'm not... what, what was the famous race that, that, that Dennis Connor had the catamaran? So that was uh, against the, against the New Zealanders. And that was, uh, you know, they interpreted the deed of gift a certain way. Yeah. Yeah. And brought, you know, a giant mono hull with wings to the to the uh, to the party, and Dennis interpreted it another way, and brought a much smaller catamaran to the party, and uh, that was sort of an infamous battle that uh, didn't do the sport any good, I don't no, think. Huh? And um, you know, the cooler heads prevailed after that, and they set up some legitimate rules and some legit, you know, retooled the deed of gift, so to speak. So I think that was ultimately a good a good step to get that one out of the way because ultimately somebody was going to challenge it that kind way. Of a it was going to happen. Yeah, it was yeah. bound to happen. It was a, you know, 100 and some odd year old document and yeah. it's bound to, <laughs> bound to be interpreted. Dust this thing <laughs> off. Let's uh Yeah. Well, cuz so, don't they say that was the regatta that was won in the courtroom and not on the water right, or something? Right. Ex exactly. And yeah. you know, there've been many court battles with the America's Cup since um over, you know, where it's to be held, how it's to be held. I mean, it, it's it's a it's an event that's always in transition. I think and always probably yeah, yeah. will be. You know, will these current uh, iteration of foiling boats, uh, you know, make the next uh, make the next you know transition to something else? I I don't know. It's hard to look into a crystal ball. No one no one thought these current boats would ever exist. If you'd yeah. asked me. If you'd asked me 15, 18 years ago if a boat could do what it's doing today, it said, no way. <laughs> yeah, right. I, I mean, I still remember the first time I saw uh, footage of Hydropter, and it was one of the, the first sort of larger foiling you know, boats that, that everybody got to see. And I thought, oh, my God, like that thing is a complete like prototype, a one-off experiment. And now, oh, they are just seeing, just seeing these guys foiling, you know, not only on flat water, but what they're doing with like the Vendee Globe and those boats. I mean, Hugo Boss just absolutely flying along through Southern Ocean weather with this big foil in the. I mean, I don't know. It's and hoping, miraculous. And hoping they don't hit, you know, something under the surface. Yeah, like yeah, a, I know, right? A submerged container or a whale or something like that. I mean, on, you know, Hugo Boss is probably a good example of how fragile those boats are because he's never yeah i mean i don't think he's finished trying, a race has he i don't think i don't think well he's definitely not finished it with not the finished the globe intact. Yeah. yeah i mean something always breaks and i mean you have to push those boats if you want to if you want to win i would suppose you have to push it to the limit and just hope were you you, you were at bitter end when uh he visited right uh i you know what i think i was but i was basically getting sparrow ready and sort of learning, you know, about my trip. And I kind of shied away because I didn't want him to tell me that, you know, I'm an idiot and I shouldn't go do, you know, I wouldn't want to be like, think he hey, would've. Alex, this is what I'm going to do. I and don't think he would. He probably wouldn't have, but I don't know. I mean, there were a lot of people that I didn't mention sort of my plans to. Yeah. Just because, I, you know, I it is sort of, unfortunately, it's a bit of a cliche. Uh, you get the solo sailor who doesn't have a ton of experience doing it that wants to go. Because yeah. that's that, you know, the holy grail of of solo ocean sailing is to to do a wrap around the globe and yeah well i'll, I'll turn the tables on you for half a second here oh uh, please do yeah uh, a good old friend of mine uh bill pinkney recently passed away yeah yeah and uh i i know you're probably very familiar with his voyage um and you probably have some insights as to what he went through because you went through a lot of it yourself was did you ever have any connectivity with him or did you I never did no unfortunately I mean I I learned about him when I did uh I think when I came down it was probably the second round 
coming down at bitter end where okay. I was trying to save the money for for the boat and for the voyage and everything. Okay. Um, but yeah, I mean, I I unfortunately I still haven't even read his book. Oh, it's a great book. It's well worth a read and uh, fascinating gentleman. He he made a lot of visits to Bitter End after his voyage too. He used to come and be part of our fall um, clinic series back. Oh, in the, okay, yeah. So he would do flotilla trips and take people out to Anagata. And oh, like really? That. And it was always fun to have him on campus there. Oh, I'll bet. How how long was his uh, circumnavigation? Uh, it was long trip i forget off the top of my head the, the book would tell you i i can't remember exactly how long it took him but uh he did make some stops yeah it wasn't non-stop and, right right um, but it was solo I it mean, was he, solo yeah. and he did the capes um and uh you know uh, just a great great uh gentleman of the sport and really you know, back in the days that he did it was long before the internet really had had become a, a force majeure. He was he was the one who pioneered you know transmitting uh, back to schools what the voyage entailed. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Okay. So he I forget how many school systems. I think the Chicago the overall Chicago public school system and the overall Boston public school system had essentially were following him and had the technology. Pre, you know, pre-internet, really. When it yeah, really it must have been down. all, you know, SSB and yeah, uh, and and they they had tracking and, and they were you know pushing it out as part of their curriculum, which was he'd really before the trip had really gone in there and dug into the schools, which I found, you know, to be something that he you know because he had a he had a vision, you know, the Chicago inner inner city vision to to really bring his trip to the kids. Yeah, you know, and and that's what I and at the same time, you know, he was he was a very laid back, low key kind of guy, and always always it always sort of was at odds. His personality always struck me as at odds with how how aggressively is not the right word, but how enthusiastically he went at installing into the schools what he was all about, and 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 I, I took away a lot from that with him, and I, it really fascinated me. I could sit and listen to some of his, uh, and it wasn't about his voyage for me, and when I would talk to him about it, I was like, how did you pass on what you did to those kids? And yeah. that was what was more interesting to me and, and, and than the voyage itself. Wow. So I didn't yeah, know what yeah, your, yeah. you know, if you had had any, t it's, it's a shame that, you know, he, he, I don't want to say died too young because he was older than I thought he was. He was always seemed very young to me. He always seemed like a very young person. And, you know, when I heard how old he actually was when he passed away, I was startled because the last time I saw him, he didn't look a day over 72 or 73. That's a, if I'd had to guess, I would have said 75 max. Yeah. And I was like, wow. How old was he? Uh, I want to say 84. 485 something like oh, that okay, again yeah. timeless and ageless individual who just you know had this look about him and enthusiasm about him that uh you know you just it was a calm enthusiasm that you could tell that translated well to to oops oh to sorry the, yeah to, to the, <laughs> nice uh, good catch to, to the, i'm uh, so enthralled i'm not I no, <laughs> no no I, I i just you know and again when he would come down and you know how bitter end can be an environment where that that sort of fosters the ability to open up about things you when you when you're sitting there looking out over north sound yeah you just you can wax poetically about anything you definitely <laughs> and, can and, and 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 he would open up about a lot of this and it was it was fascinating to to listen to and his i you know, i kind of wish as an as a national resource that he was still around and you know when he got enshrined into the uh, uh sailing national hall of fame a year and a half two years two years ago now i guess it was i was like this is great because it's going to shine a really bright light on everything he's accomplished and who he is and and the type of voyage he did like you've done and right, right. and you know how that can instill in people um you know a passion and you know i'd, I'd love to hear stories I, I look forward to as i get older hearing stories about kids that he inspired and you inspired i know that you've inspired a lot of people so try to try yeah. to yeah. so so i i think the voyage is like what you do and i'd don't mean to digress and put you on the other side of this necessarily, no, but, oh I, gosh, no. but I, I, I think that, that voyages like what he did and like what you did um, are really inspirational. People can go sailboat racing every day and not inspire a lot of stuff. Dennis Conner is not the most inspi inspirational person that I know. <laughs> guys like you guys are 
are you know people that we we should all look to and say this is this is really this this builds character and builds inspiration in us and and to see what you know what it brings to to what's the, what's the right word the general population much more meaningful to me than what a, you know an America's Cup race or a Dennis Conner type thing uh, it's all it's all well and good but it's it's much more fleeting than yeah well because you know and there's another race the next year or the next four years or whatever and all of a sudden. And- the last one is, is forgotten about. Yeah, and, yeah. Yeah, granted, you know, when there's celebrations of, you know, the losing of the America's Cup, you know, suddenly the mainstream media refocuses on jumps it. Jumps right on board, and yeah. It jumps right on board, and everybody's, po- hey, everybody's posting about it. And, you know, we're, in, <laughs> right. we're, in the, we're in the, you know, social media era where if you see a good meme about it, you go, oh, I'm going to share that. That's pretty cool, you know. It's like, who knows who generated it, but okay. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> cool. right. No, exactly. But, but the, the real, you know, the real voyages and the real... Um, you know, what's the right accomplishments are what to me are more meaningful. Well, and the, the, when I think of, you know, Bernard Motissier's book, The Long Way, uh, Knox Johnson's book, A World of My Own, even Peter Nichols' book, uh, A Voyage for Mad Men, you know, those were the sort of eye opening reads that, that even just sparked, not only sparked the idea of doing a big trip like that, but it was, I just didn't even know that stuff happened. I didn't know people tried to sail boats alone around the world. And yeah. as I was getting into sailing and getting into offshore sailing, doing yacht deliveries, that was one of the things that, you know, I was like, oh, you can take this to a whole different level. This is crazy. I, I hadn't ever even thought people would attempt to do something like that. And, and I mean, how many, how many solo sailors do you think those books have inspired to get out there. I mean, tons. geez, oh, tons. thousands and tons. thousands of people. Well, if I remember correctly, not Knox Johnson was like your big, you, that was who you really, I, I think I related to him. I, I always felt like there was a bit of a mix, you know, uh, Knox Johnson sort of had this can do attitude and, you know, never say die. Like, let's just we'll brunt right through it. Yep. I got a slow boat, but I'm going to leave early. I'm going to get my head bashed in down in the Southern Ocean, but he just kept going. No matter how many things broke and how yeah. how bad it got, he just kept going. And but I also relate pretty well to you know Mauticier and how how he just connected with the world around him. And you know they they definitely describe when he gets down towards Cape Horn and he gets real poetic. I mean, people. Some people say it's like reading somebody who's having like an acid trip or something. Yeah. You know, seeing diamonds on the sails and blah, all this sort of stuff. But I, I can sort of relate to that because I think I try to stay as connected as I can to that. Um, you know, when you read a world of my own, Knox Johnson doesn't ever really get into that. I don't think he talks about how beautiful the day is pretty yeah. much on any of those. It's right. like, yeah, we were sailing hard and fast or Going we were the calm. and that sort of thing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I don't know. I, I mean, I kind of like a little bit of balance in between. Well, it's, it's funny when, when, you know, you talk about round the world sailors, my, my only experience as a kid growing up was none of those books. I'm afraid was, <laughs> was dove. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, and, that's a huge one there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And that, you know, and I remember very well, I forget what, you know, what year that was, but I remember reading about uh, Robin Lee Graham's stop at Bitter End. Yeah. And, you know, it was very funny that, you know, many years later, I'd find myself there at a place that he, that, you know, he held pretty, pretty near and dear to his heart for a period of time. Mm-hmm. And that's where he made the transition from Dove 1 to Dove 2, right in North Sound. And, you know, there's a lot of, there was, of course, the rumor that we never were quite sure about, but... Uh, the some, mast, right? Yeah, some of the some of the uh, rigging and masts were, were left behind from... Uh, I, I, but I, I don't know if that how much of that story it was. Mary Jo swore that that post in the old clubhouse, as you make the corner to face the big long bar, yeah, that was part of his mast. Uh, okay. I, Who yeah, knows? No, no, I remember that story yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah. And, and there were also stories that uh, you know that on Dean's mast, the Maxi Yacht's mast was somewhere in at Bitter End, and there's also a story that part of it was at. Drake's Anchorage over on Mosquito Island. So, oh right, so right. we never knew what was the real stories on that. Either. These old, like the old <laughs> a, a lot lore. Of, lot of, I know. Lot of fun, I love it. A lot of fun <laughs> myths about that, but you know, Dove was was sort of a, a fascinating read for anybody who was a 
you know, a young sailor and wanted to, you know, do something maybe other than racing all the time in a Blue Jay or a Dyer Dow or whatever type of boat they were sailing at the time. It was sort of the fantasy escape yeah, yeah. Book and read for for you know a young sailor in those days, and you know the way he went about it was very different from the way say you went about it or Bill Pinkney went about it or any of the other uh, sailors that you mentioned previously. Um, did it with lots of stops and romance and seventies angst and 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 you know that sort of thing. And it was, it, you know, I remember I'll never forget the. Uh, National Geographic. Yeah, I've seen that. One. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. They made a movie, and then the you know, National Geographic was obviously what you know one of the big periodicals back then. Mm -hmm. And you'd everybody look for, had them. You'd you'd look forward to to the issue, the next issue that co was covering his journey. Yeah, and, yeah. And you know that made sailing, not racing sailing, obviously, but cruising sailing more mainstream because of him. And I think that inspired a lot of latter day cruising sailors that uh you know maybe uh you know we're seeing the next two generations of that amongst a lot of the uh you know what's the right word social media uh the deloses and the yeah and the vagabonds it and, is and a saturated market when it comes i mean so many people now and maybe saturated is it's kind of more of a negative term but there are so many people that are out there that are sharing their experiences. I think it's very cool. I mean, I think it's 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 you know, I, and I think you know, sort of the the doves type the dove type experience uh, spawned a lot of that you know two three generations ago that you know a lot of those you know obviously the Delos people are much younger and the vagabond people are much younger, but uh, there was a sort of a generation in between that you know took off on. Uh, whether it was an Amel Super Maramu or an Oyster or a Swan or a Tayana or any of those boats and just let go of the dock lines and went cruising, you know, in the South Pacific and went yeah, cruising yeah. in the Caribbean and went cruising in the Med and, you know, just, you know, forgot about that they had a, you know, a house at home somewhere and, and just, just <laughs> the boat became their home. Right, I think, yeah. I think uh, the Dove experience probably helped spawn that. It made it romantic. It made these places like Nuka Hiva and 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 all these South Pacific locations seem really romantic and and I, attainable too and, atta and attainable yeah if a, if a 17 year old can do it any of us can do it and that was the you know the, it was fascinating for me at the time because I was you know I, don't know, I was a couple of years younger than that or right, right. the same age and I was like wow maybe someday I can do something like that but my my life didn't follow that path it followed sort of the more racing uh, side yeah, of things yeah yeah so. yeah and yeah so but it's interesting i mean yeah i mean i i would think because i've been puzzling through my head you know as i as i prepare to go and and talk to the ior group uh it's one of those things where yeah how do you inspire people and i think really how do you inspire people to sort of keep sailing and and get into sailing and all that and really i think it it is about sort of sharing these experiences sharing not only the adventures but you know, uh, making it, making it seem, uh, I don't know how I'm going to try and say this, not make it just attainable, but something that is, is not something like, oh, I could never do that. That's something that, yeah, if you, if you go through some of these steps and you keep sailing and you, you know, you get out there, then this, this is an absolute possibility Absolutely. for anyone that wants to do it. Absolutely. And a lot of those, um, you know, sort of, uh, college age kids that, uh, you know, they're all seeing, um, if you, it'd be interesting to see, ask them to raise their hand and ask if, how many of them follow things like Vagabond and Delos? And oh, I'm some sure of, it's and some huge. Of, yeah, it'd be interesting to see what the room says. You know, how many of them follow any of the, uh, there's a name for what's the, you know, at, at the Annapolis Boat Show, for instance, uh, mm -hmm. which is the Power Boat Shows this week and the Sailboat Shows next week. They have an entire two-tent area of all the influencers, as they call them. Yeah, and, yeah. And they all show up or, you know, whoever's available or whoever's in the area. Uh, last year or the year before, Vagabond showed up. Delos was there. Um, it was interesting to see, I, I hate to, I don't want to call it groupies, but sailing enthusiasts that follow these people are really into it. And they, yeah. I, I love that about it. And, you know, I'm sure there are tried and true sailors that sort of 
blow that off and say, oh, you know, I would never, never do that. But deep down, they do. Because where, where, yeah, where, yeah. where else are the million followers coming from? <laughs> <laughs> exactly, right? Yeah. So, and, and, and why am I standing next to you 20 feet from their booth as you're looking over at it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. How come you can't keep your eyes off those people? I mean, there is, I mean, you know, essentially you get to a certain point on YouTube and, and you are, you are a, a celebrity at that point. I mean, I, I had Sam Holmes on the podcast and he's, uh, he's one of the more popular uh, solo sailors and he, very basic, you know, raw footage, just crossing oceans. He, I think he put one video out four or five years ago where he sailed from LA to Hawaii and that one just took off. Yeah. And then ever since then, you know, he just films it right on his phone and nicest guy ever. He totally, he's not putting on a show. He's not trying to make sort of a soap opera out of it, Yeah. but he's sharing his experience. And I, I will say it made me think when you said, you know, have everybody raise their hand who's who watches some of those YouTube. I would want to I'd be curious as well. How many people have read Sailing Alone Around the World by yeah. Slocum? Yeah. You know, because yeah, yeah. that I mean, if you think about it, the same it's the same theme. You know, they only had the the platform of writing a book to share their experiences. Right. And then it went to, you know, videos and now it's social media and. It's the same sort of stuff. You're just, I, you're just kind of going out. You do this stuff, and you bring it back to the world to try and yeah, sort I'd, of share your experience. I'd be, I'd be curious as well. I mean, I think with an audience like that, it's, I'd want to know what they're, what, what's influencing, what's them. getting them, yeah, what's yeah. getting them going, what's, what gets their motor going when it's, when you know, when it comes to sailing, what. Uh, what you know and i'm sure if they're at a sailboat regatta like that it's racing too obviously but oh yeah but behind the scenes is there a little bit of a fantasy of you know crossing the atlantic and finding okay, that you, tropical island somewhere yeah you know? and even if it's you know even if it's you know you see a lot of hybrid race cruises now like the arc yeah is, yeah is a classic example of that where you know, okay, I'm going to play to the cruisers here. I'm, it's a cruising event, but I'm going to put a little bit of a racing bent to it just to keep the people, you know, engaged a little bit. And you see more and more of that going on right now to reel people back into the sport, which I think is good. There's a lot of people who sailboat racing can turn people off or it can re-energize people. Same side, same conversely cruising yeah it's like oh, i'm not a cruising sailor but that does look enticing over there at the charter oh yeah i do charter then you're a cruising sailor too. yeah yeah <laughs> you know? you're part of the club you're hop on the... in the water's yeah. warm yeah it's amazing to me how many people i will say you know they're you're a racing sailor yeah oh yeah died in yeah died in the wall i, 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 I don't cruise at all you ever chartered oh yeah every every season i charter once or twice i was like do you race while you're no? Then you're a cruiser. <laughs> cruiser. Hey, welcome. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So well, what was that? There was always that one that goes down the Baja Peninsula. It's been going on for a long, long time. Ha ha ha. Yeah, yeah. That's I mean, yeah. that's been going for forty years or something. Uh, that I can remember. Richard Spindler started that from Latitude Thirty Eight magazine. Yeah. And that's still going on and still draws big crowd and it's a it's another one of those hybrid events. It's a, right. it's a race that's really for cruising boats, or it's a cruising event that's really racing. <laughs> yeah, so, so you get a both. little bit of both, I right? Think, I think you do, and I think the more we're going to see more and more of that going forward. There's a lot of boats out there. There's a lot of sailboats out there, and not all of them race and not all of them cruise, and whenever you can get them to do both, all the better. It just yeah, yeah. gets people. There are plenty of people who will, you know, we're, we're, uh, we're a dealer for... Uh, Hansa sailboats and Daler sailboats, which are come out of the same, you know, mother mother company in in Germany, and one is supposed to be more of a racing oriented boat, one's supposed to be more of a cruising oriented boat, and the lines are so blurred between the two nowadays. That oh, I'll bet. when you're when you're selling one or the other, you're like, oh yeah, is it a cruiser racer or a racer cruiser? And this goes back, you know, when I was an editor at Sailing World magazine, we started something called Boat of the Year, uh, and there was always this dilemma, do we have a, a category that was called cruiser racer, or do we have a category that's called racer cruiser, racer, cruiser and yeah. which is it? It's, it's both, you know, but, <laughs> but there was such blurred lines between them that... Uh, partly cloudy or partly sunny. Yeah, ex yeah. exactly, and, and it, you know, I'd love to hear, you know, you, you'll have the unique ex uh, opportunity to poll a room and say... You know, how many of you grew up racing and how many of you grew up cruising? That's also a question that, uh, you know, 
I used to ask at seminars when I was doing seminars at boat shows 30 years ago, I would, you know, say, who, you know, who in the room were cruisers, who in the room were racers? And I'd always want to see the hands go up. And then you'd, you'd hear later in the seminar when they'd answer a question. It's like, that sounds like a racing answer coming from a cruiser over there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, right. Well, because, so. you know, the, you only know deep down inside what your passion really is. And and I've always thought that's a great part of the sort of the sailing world is that, yeah, I mean, if if the competitive side is for you and that's what you like, and if if you were just out sailing for the day, it might be fun, but it's not going to get you going. Yeah. Then hey, you've got this whole racing scene that you can dive right into. But on the other thing is, if if you don't like the the high pressure, the close quarters on the start line, all that sort of stuff, and you do want to just sail off and find a nice place to anchor and just enjoy the view, you've got this whole side of it, and. Yeah. I think the industry as a whole caters to both. That's a, that's the good part of it, and you know, for what I do nowadays, it's it's you know fun to see when a you know when a client comes in and you know they're they're thinking of getting into you know into sailing. Yeah, I love to hear that because you know which which way do you want to go with it? What do you you know what what's what's uh, what's your interest here? What sparked your interest? And it, it's always you sort of have to back it up two steps to see what sparked their interest, what got them to come in and say, I want to get into sailing. I want to get into boating. I want to get into this. And you got to take it back. Sometimes you got to go way yeah. back to find sort of what in the psyche triggered their reason for coming in and what, uh, you know, if it's a client that's, you know, had three J boats and, and two, uh, two other race boat type thing, you know what they're into. Or if they have an ML 50 and they want to get an ML 60 or they want to go even bigger world cruising that sort of thing, you know what they're into, but it's that it's the, you know, hundreds of thousands of people in the middle between those two extremes. Yeah. You yeah. Yeah. Go, sort which of. way are we going to go with that? <laughs> right. Well, and you, you sort of get to be like their Sherpa through that, that trying to figure out what's going to work out best yeah in in every single aspect i i didn't really think about it that way i mean in some in some ways i think the idea of like a yacht broker would be somebody uh, comparable to you know a car salesman but i i don't think it's i think it has a, a whole lot more because it's it really is not uh it's not like you're selling tugboats you're selling boats that are almost like a lifestyle yeah absolutely and i'm i'm couldn't describe it at all because I mean you're the professional here and uh, <laughs> no, you got it right it's a lifestyle and, and you know a lot of times you sort of have to step back and see you know in talking to the the potential boat buyer what what sparked their interest like I said a minute ago you, you have to sort of see is is it the lifestyle what part of the lifestyle is it is it the the fantasy of casting off the lines and going, you know, across transatlantic or down to the South Pacific or whatever, or is it, Hey, I saw these people, you know, racing off the waterfront the other day, boy, that looked like they were having a ball and Oh, that party afterwards looked like even more fun. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I want to get into that type thing. And, and then as they, as their experience evolves or as they're, they start looking at it, they, they say, well, yeah, I like that racing thing, but it'd be nice if it had a really plush interior to go with. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's where I'm sure it must get a little tricky where you have to really weigh like, well, you can have this, but that adds this much weight and that's going to affect this. And yeah, you look at, you know, you look at J boats, which is one of our, one of our lines and, and. They've done a really good job over the years of, you know, evolving as their clients evolve, as their owners evolve, and as, uh, you know, their owners want the next thing in, in next boat in in the progression. They may have started with a J24 35 years ago, and yeah. and, and they they stepped up to a J105, which was kind of the cool one design, you know, then uh, later on, and then they step up to a. Uh, Let's call it a J35, because that was another big one design class. And then all of a sudden they say, ah, I might go cruising for a little while. They get a J42, which is a cruising boat, no racing aspirations. Oh, uh, um, okay, yeah. So, and then they say, well, you know what? It, it's a good performing boat and has a nice interior, but maybe I get back into racing again. And and they keep evolving, and and that's a brand that does a pretty good job of a, of addressing that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, others, you know, uh, what's what's sorry to interrupt. What's yeah. their cool new boat right now? So the J forty five is their is their current cool new boat. It's, yeah, uh, yeah, you know, but it, it but they also introduced um, last year a uh, a littler day sailor that they call the J nine, which is purely a day sail boat there's very little interior a giant cockpit yeah um and you know for under 30 foot boat it's the perfect little day sailor that's that's 
very cool for a certain segment of the market. But if you wanted to go racer cruiser, the 45 is sort of their their hot you know hot boat right now. We're going to be showing them off down in uh, Annapolis again uh, Ooh, in, in nice, next week. Nice. So um, you know hull. I forget which hull. Is it hull. They've been hull six or. Uh, races out of American Yacht Club right near here mm -hmm. and was the first one in America. And uh, little known to many of your uh, of your listeners, probably J-Boats are primarily built in France now. Uh, oh, really? Oh, yeah, okay. the Johnstone family obviously is an American family and yeah. they were, most of the J-Boats were, over the years, were, were built in, uh, in Rhode Island. And um, some models still are. Uh, the J-9 is still built in Rhode Island, for instance. But the... Um, J45 and the J112E, the J99, uh, what else? They're all built in uh, France. Uh, which is I didn't know that. Yeah, and then finished off over here and then delivered over here. So um, it's still, you know, Jeff Johnstone is still the, you know, the leader of the pack. And yeah. uh, they're, they're based in Newport, Rhode Island. and uh, But the, the builds are actually primarily done in, in France. And they, they must ship them over. They do. Yeah, yeah they're not yeah. they're not coming over on their no, keel, right? No, our uh, we're a dealer for uh, for Amel yachts, which I don't know how familiar you are. A little now. bit, yeah, yeah. They're they're built in La Rochelle, France, and they're in my in my estimation the best pure cruising sailboat that's on the market today. nowadays. Oh wow! Yeah, it's, okay. Uh, if I had. Uh, if, if I was to do a trip like yours with more people aboard, of course, yeah, if I was to do a trip like yours, <laughs> you're uh, a social creature, uh, John. Yeah, I, 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 you know, <laughs> I, I would, I would pick an ML fifty or an ML sixty all day and all night. Uh, Fiberglass. Uh, yeah, yeah. That's one. That's, that's the design right on the wall behind you there. Oh, nice. Yeah. So that's that's. Um, so they they've sort of burst onto the scene. You probably saw you know saw many of the previous generation of Mel's down in the Caribbean, the BVI oh, yeah, over the yeah. years. The Super Maramu was probably the most popular offshore cruising boat in America for I don't know twenty years. It's still to, I mean more common in California for some reason. Despite being built in France, you'd see tons of them out on the West Coast, uh, San Francisco really? down to down to Cabo. Uh, yeah. Many, many of them out there, uh, but I, you know, when we were together, when you and I were working together down in the BVI, I'd probably see two a week come into our mooring field on on cruising expeditions. Yeah, and yeah. Delos, uh, sailing vessel Delos, who's the probably the second biggest influencer right. sailing influencer in the world right now. That's a that's a that's what they're ML. on. Yeah, it's an ML. Yeah, but it's a it's a two generation ago ML. The current generation is really spectacular yeah like I, say, I, if I was you know but it's it's purpose-built offshore world cruising you rarely see an ml in the same place more than a day at a time they're, they're <laughs> on always, the move, they're yeah, always yeah. on the functional move. very yeah, functional yeah and the, the, most people that own them don't have a home somewhere else or if they do it the shutters are on it and the doors are locked and the electricity's <laughs> yeah, right. turned off and they are you know out somewhere cruising I yeah, mean, I, yeah. I love tracking them on uh, on AIS. I follow a lot of the 50s around the world. We've sold a bunch, and uh, I follow them, and I follow them on, on, on Instagram. I always want to know what they're up to because it's always something fascinating. There's yeah. probably 20 or 30 of them that are active on, on uh, Instagram and following their feeds. So much fun. All over the world, yeah, yeah. I'll bet. Jeez. And that's, you know, it's a fantasy-type thing. You're looking at it, you're like, you're where now? <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly and right you, and you'll be where tomorrow and then you'll be where nice. the next day <laughs> yeah so. well, we get that a lot with uh i get a lot of emails from people who have purchased west sales younger yeah. younger people that um you know sort of get inspired by either stuff that that i say on the podcast or just some of the adventures that i go on and and they're you know they're staring down the world now just ready to pounce and a few of them are, are just sort of cutting their teeth they're learning you know how the boat works and everything and that's one of the nicest emails i can ever get is from somebody who's like oh my gosh i got my west sail it's in terrible shape <laughs> i got so much work to do but i'm gonna haul out here and blah 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 and then you know trying to work with them to because a lot of people want to know what modifications i did 
sort of uh, beef it up even more. Yeah. Um, you know, I and I don't know. I always try and say, you know, I'm not an expert. I just have a decent amount of experience. Sure. I don't know if any of the stuff that I did actually it made a difference. It works because you're sitting right here. Well, right that's now. true. <laughs> it I mean, clearly you know, it worked. <laughs> but it, it's, worked. it is it's one of those things where I, I try not to take too much responsibility when, you know, informing people of like, oh, okay, well, we increase the size of this or we up the uh, diameter of this wire or that, you know, that sort of stuff. But I'll, I'll never... It, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. It's really, it just, it's one of those feelings. And I, I, I think there's like three people that they've like, they send pictures of the boat and you can see this big smile on their face where they're just like, no doubt. yes, I'm there. No doubt. No, I, I, you know, when, uh, you know, when we were reminiscing a little bit ago about Dove, I'll never forget, um, sailing magazine which is the big format sailing publication back in the day i don't, I don't even know if it's still published i think it is still published these days it's uh, out of wisconsin oh okay yeah. and a big format uh, and it was always had the best covers and always had you know it, back in the late 70s and mid 70s it, it was I, I it was my favorite magazine it was one of the few i had subscriptions to back <laughs> yeah, in those yeah days. right <laughs> and i'll never forget they did uh what year did the west sail come out what, what was the it was like 70 70- I want to say 72, but I, I, I can hear the West Sale family cringing because I don't know. <laughs> sorry, sorry to put yeah. you on the spot. <laughs> no, it's okay. <laughs> I, I lead through my, uh, you know, my voyages, uh, my knowledge on the, the no, whole stuff. I, I leave that for. But other. I'll never forget they did a, uh, it, it, it clearly must have been in the you know early 70s, mid 70s, because that was when I had my subscription to Sailing Magazine. That's when it started. And I think it was a black and white edition uh, yeah. that had a full review of the West, the West Sail 30 yeah. when it came out. And I was like, that's the boat I want. <laughs> <That's the> boat <laughs> oh, I, want. I remember you telling me that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it was, you know, it, again, life comes full circle sometimes, but it's interesting to see that, you know, that there's such a, a big following for it still the, to this day. And it's clearly stood the test of time. It definitely has. I mean, you know, and I, I was really fortunate this uh, – this last fall or, or right before the summer, this last spring, I got sort of hired on by this couple, uh, shout out Mark and Steph, who had purchased uh, the finest example of a West Sail 32 I've ever seen. Nice. This, this guy who was a former astronaut owned the boat, was using it for, you know, just day sailing and stuff like that, but then hauled it out of the water for, I don't know, 10 years. And it was just his pet project. Yeah. And he hired on people from, Pacific Seacraft oh, wow. and all the stuff to come down and basically gut the whole thing and start rebuilding it as if it is a absolute high end luxury boat. And I, I mean, I walked down on that thing, went down below and I was just like, holy cow. Like I didn't even know this was like didn't, possible. Didn't recognize no, it. <laughs> it felt bigger. The varnish was, you know, to the 10th degree. And I mean, I just, I almost felt a little uncomfortable in the beginning because I, I'm so used to Sparrow being this rough and tumble thing. You put your cup down, you don't worry about it. You yeah. know, you smear sunscreen on your arm and you can just do whatever. But holy cow, that thing, I was like, I Great. didn't want to leave fingerprints <laughs> on anything. It was beautiful. I did a, um, a walkthrough tour and threw that up on YouTube, but it was. It was just such a, a phenomenal boat. I mean, wow. holy cow. Yeah, I, I got to look at that YouTube video. I have not seen that, so I'll have to look. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I that would. That was... would you know, there, there are times where I have the same reaction where I'll be, you know, looking at a boat for evaluation for a, for a listing or something like that. And I'll, I'll be coming to the boat expecting one thing and then I'll open the, the companion way. I'll look down below and go, oh, my gosh. You, you, you know, sometimes it's not a positive reaction. Yeah, yeah, But yeah. when it is that reaction, <laughs> when you see, wow, this boat has been incredibly well maintained, has been modified in such ways that I couldn't imagine. And, and all the improvements that if, if I had a million bucks, I would do myself. Yeah. I, I walked down, but I was like, Oop, take the, take the flops off, take uh -huh. the, you know, walk, tr tread lightly and don't touch anything. Let me put some yeah. socks on actually yeah. here, real yeah. clean ones. Yeah. So <laughs> I, there've been times where I've actually done that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah oh, there, I don't there, doubt there, it. There've been, there been times. <laughs> well, and, and John, not to like switch gears into sort of what you're doing, but I definitely want to, uh, I want to hear a little bit about, you know, exactly so how long have you been uh, a yacht broker now? So, you know, when, when the hurricane hit um, bit around, as, as you know, there was, you know, it was totally destroyed. And yeah. And there, you know, I, I participated heavily in the fundraising efforts afterwards to, to, to help the staff out and folks on Virgin Gordon 
we were very proud of raising, you know, mil, you know, half a million bucks right off the bat to to help support all of that. So I I stuck around and 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 did as much as I could to be part of that program. Um, but as time wore on, it became you know somewhat obvious that this was going to take a long time yeah. to to rebuild, and there wasn't going to be you know a, a lot for me to do as time went on. So. You know, the, the the writing was sort of on the wall for me that uh, you know I needed to start looking at other Something things else. to do. Yeah, yeah. Um, while while still, you know, helping out wherever I could and doing what I could, and so I, the Hokans were very gracious, and and uh, we carved out a you know a, a nice arrangement where I could you know move on and do yacht brokering. That was about five and a half years ago now, mm-hmm. and some of it ran concurrent with what I was doing at Bitterrand until about a year ago. Uh, so I. You know, in, until things really got up to full speed, I was still doing what I was doing there, too, alongside yeah. of being a yacht broker. Um, but, you know, boats have been, you know, my passion all my life. And, you know, you, you'd, you'd probably see me when I was down at Bitter End, and I'd, I'd spend half my, you know, afternoon after after work sort of shut down kind of for me, just looking out on the harbor and I know, seeing, I know. seeing what was you there. You always had that what, eye out. Like, yeah, oh, what, what's, see what's, that boat? what's in tonight? What's what's arrived today? Yeah. Well, you know, and... and Obviously, there were all the charter boats, but I was more usually more focused on you know the private boats that were coming and going, and talking to people on the docks, and just striking up conversations at the pub, and and you know f- figuring out what people were were do how they were using their boats and, yeah. and what they enjoyed about them, and getting to know our quarter deck members at Bitter End, and just learning about their experiences with the boats. So it was a natural transition for me to go into into yacht brokerage and. Um, McMichaels, who I work for now, Howie McMichael was a legend in the uh, in the boat brokerage world, and uh, you know the officer in the Maranek, New York, which isn't far from where I live. Mm-hmm. And uh, so he had me come into the office one day, and and you know we knew each other tangentially, but uh, got to know each other a little bit more, and got to know the the team at McMichael, and and started here uh, five and a half years ago. And you know the the transition was relatively easy because you know knew, knew a lot of people because of the bitter end and because i was always at boat yeah, shows you got all I was the at connections boats. already <laughs> i was i was doing uh you know with bitter end doing uh seven eight boat shows a year on yeah. average you know oh with, i remember a couple <laughs> of them with yeah, yeah. annapolis <laughs> one year and do you ever come to chicago as well i or? never came to chicago but i think i was i was in newport yeah. um yeah there were a couple yeah yeah, yeah. always We'd, a good time in, in at the at the peak of it we were doing uh you know strictly sail uh california which was in in uh, Oakland and San Francisco back in the day, we were doing uh, Chicago, we were doing Miami, we were doing Newport, we were doing Annapolis, we were doing Providence, we were doing uh, Boston, we were doing a lot yeah, of those yeah. shows. So you know, I got to know the marine industry really well, um, and got to, you know got friendly with a lot of folks in the brokerage business just because we were at boat show parties and we were <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so I, yeah I, right. I knew a lot of them anyway. So it was a lot, it was a lot of fun. And, uh, you know, so it was a fairly easy transition. Boat brokerage, we're, we're both a, uh, a new boat dealer mm-hmm. for a variety of brands, um, power and sail, and also um, on the brokerage side, used boat side of things. And, you know, it, it, shifting gears between the two can be uh, an interesting uh, challenge because one day you might be selling a new J45, you know, the hottest thing from J-Boats these days, and the next day you might be selling an Island Pack at 37. Well, uh, what was the one you were showing today? That was uh, a used boat, isn't uh, it? Uh, no, today was a uh, a new boat, actually. It was a Sea Trials on a, uh, oh. a small power boat uh, line that's actually part of... Uh, so Hansa, the, uh, I always affectionately call them the house of Hansa in Germany. They, <laughs> they have a number of different lines. So they have Hansa sailboats, they have Daler sailboats, they have sea line power boats, they have fjord power boats, and they spun off, uh, recently a smaller line of power boats called Rick, R-Y-C-K. And nice little, uh, they're part of the, uh, what I affectionately call the, uh, the Euro sport boat invasion. Uh, ah, which yeah, is, yeah. There's a, a variety of brands. I won't name them all right now, but there's five or six brands that, that sort of play in that universe, and Rick is one of them. And uh, nice, sporty little single engine, uh, single 300 horsepower, uh, you know, cuddy cabin type boats that yeah, yeah. Uh, really good for, you know, family type things. So that's what I was doing today. Yesterday, I was uh, again shifting gears. I was showing a beautiful Larian 33. 
uh, you know, that which is that's the is, one that I saw on yeah. Instagram, I think. Yeah, stunning sailboat, uh, red, right? Red, claret, yeah. red. Um, uh, so Alarian, um, nice, uh, you know, sort of primarily, it's really stunning boats, they're just beautiful lines. Um, you know, not racing boats, they're cruiser. They're cruisers that have good performance. Yeah, yeah. And they're, you know, they're for people who really want something, you know, that's going to turn heads in the mooring field. Yeah, yeah. And that was a beautiful be- boat. Beautiful boat. And uh, Alarian has, you know, boats up to 41 feet, I think it is, down to, and then down to 20 feet. They're not in, uh, they're not a new boat brand anymore. Uh, they they don't make boats at the moment. They're out of production. Though I hear there might be going, they might be going back into production. Mm. They were sort of a sister brand to J Boats a oh, long okay. time a long time ago. They were coming yeah. out of the same TPI factory. Um, so, uh, but we're J Boats uh, dealer and J Boats brokerage. We we're probably I would have to guess we probably sell the most J Boats in brokerage of any. Uh, brokerage in the Northeast for sure, if not the country. So whether there it's you, go. you know whether it's a you know old J twenty no we wouldn't sell an old J twenty four J twenty four but J seventies uh, and J ninety nines and J eighties J one hundred five. Oh, there's there's one every inch I think. <laughs> well, and and I guess if you were you know putting if I were to be someone who was who's looking actively looking for for some type of boat, you know. Obviously, the first thing to do is probably they're going on the internet and seeing what's out there. But yep. you know, when it comes to actually getting to a point where you're like, okay, it's time to pull the trigger on this. I mean, it's always better to have a yacht broker. Uh, absolutely. The, the you know the the fallacy of it all is that people think that they're going to somehow save some money by um, by buying directly with a broker they're not familiar with. Yeah. And, um, so it's always I think it's always good to engage you know your your friendly neighborhood broker to help you out with the deal and there's no money to be saved by going necessarily directly to uh, a listing broker so so it's like home sales I'll, I'll use that analogy a little bit there's a listing broker uh-huh. always yeah and then potentially a selling broker as well who will help suss out a boat for a client so they could help the client, you know, comb the internet. Sometimes, you know, uh, a selling broker or a buy side broker, as we call them, uh, will, you know, keep watch lists and we'll know, we'll have a little bit more insider information of when something's going to come on the market mm-hmm. uh, than, than the average person might have. So you can, let's say someone wants a, uh, you know, let's say a J112E that uh, they've been looking for for a long time, but there's none out there right now. Well, we might know of you know one of our clients who's getting ready. To oh, list, you got the inside track. Yeah, yeah. So, so that that helps sometimes, um, and it's you know there's plenty of times where, again, using the, the the real estate analogy, where a broker will be both the buy and sell side of things. It happens from t- you know from time to time, and there's always the the nervousness. Well, who are you representing? Yeah, and the yeah. question always comes up. And you know, if it's if it's a multi you know multi million dollar boat or let's say over five hundred thousand dollar boat, it's probably good to have someone on both sides of it and someone championing your your best needs on yeah. this sort of thing. But uh, you know, if it's a a boat under one hundred fifty thousand dollars, let's say, uh, you know, having going directly to the broker that can be okay too. I mean, it it depends. And you know, one of the things we're big on is relationships. We have, you know. Each of us at this office probably have upwards of between 500 and 1,200 clients oh, that, really? wow. that we actively stay in touch with, that we actively engage. One of the one of the upsides to McMichael is that we also have two boat yards, and we have a sailboat yard that you're sitting here at. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and yeah, we have yeah. a powerboat yard that's um, just around the bend. That's where I was coming from when I first came over to see you earlier. Yeah. Um, that's just around across the harbor and around the bend over there. And, you know, we're fortunate in that we can stay in face-to-face contact with a lot of our clients because they're here at the yard. This time of year, boats are starting to come back into the yard for winter storage. And just walking up and down the yard here, I'll bump into, you know, 10, 15 clients a day. Just yeah. that, that. So we try and forge, you know, strong relationships so that they know what we're, what we're doing. We know what they're doing. We know what they're, as, as you probably have heard, there's, there's always this saying that 
uh, boat owners are always looking for their next boat, <laughs> and you know it's very <laughs> rare. It's very rare that yeah, someone will. Sue with it. Yeah. Very, you know, you've had your boat for a long time now, but that's been a passion and a labor of love for you yes. too, right? So, um, but, bane of my existence. <laughs> no, <laughs> but there, but there's, there's a lot of people who that you know. Gosh, you just you just bought this. Uh, you know, Hansa 415, now you want the Hansa 410 because it's the latest model coming out. Okay, I get it, but, you know. Right, <laughs> right, you're, right. You're, or, they're, or they're looking for the, you know, their family's growing, and they're looking, for, you know, they, they yeah, have they two more kids, the and they're looking bit, for right. an extra, one more stateroom on the boat. And uh, so that's, that's you know, keeping in touch with our clients is a very, you know, we're, we're all about, uh, and this is a hackneyed saying, but we're all about customer service and staying in touch. I mean, um, you know me well enough to know that I can talk a blue streak, and and, and most 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 <laughs> absolutely boat, most <laughs> most boaters like to do that. Yes. And, oh yeah. And and I'm also a good listener. <laughs> yeah. No, it's true. I you know I I speaking as someone who went you know and and essentially saw the boat online, contacted the owner, um, you know, went and saw it as soon as I could, and ended up getting sort of. I, I don't I would never say I got a raw deal, but I definitely uh there were a lot of things wrong with, with Mighty Sparrow or incomplete, I should say, yeah. um, that weren't sort of brought to light. Yeah. And and I do, you know, when I think about being in that position again, I think I for sure would want sort of an expert there, somebody to at least cause I you know, when I think about the amount of money that it cost me um, to fix some of the issues that I didn't know about on that boat, right? Uh, it would have well, it would have been, it would have been hugely worthwhile to actually have a professional that was there that was sort of like, hey, listen, you know, this is just what I noticed, and I, you know, I mean, not even talking about like a surveyor or anything, but just that sharp eye of someone who's a pro. Well, you know, and, and you, by by mentioning surveyors, you bring up an interesting uh, um, debate in our industry and. Surveyors are critical to it. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm a big fan. There's, there's probably thirty or forty of them. We have a standard list, and much like home inspection folks, you, you can't specifically a broker can't specifically recommend yeah. a particular surveyor. You have to give a list and maybe recommend three or four off of that list that are good for that type of boat. Much like a real estate broker would do with a house. Yeah, yeah. You know, someone's better at a mansion than they are at a split level uh, such and such. Right, you know? right. So same thing in the boating industry. What's good for power is not always good for sale and vice versa. What's good for a small day sailor is not necessarily good for a 70-foot uh you know, offshore sloop. So, <laughs> right. so yeah. surveyors are a, a big part of our industry. And, you know, you're going to be giving a, uh, uh, a, a talk tomorrow or the next day at, um, the, uh, to collegiate kids. And one of the, in, you know, one of the interesting professions that is underserved in the, um, in the marine industry is surveying. Yeah. And there is, they're hard to find sometimes. They're extremely hard to find and they are aging out in big numbers. Yeah. And, you know, the, the talent pool right now is very small. And unfortunately, um, you know, it can take three weeks or a month to find a good surveyor to survey your average sailboat or powerboat for that matter. Yeah. And conversely, though, for someone really eager and, and keen to make a ton of money and do a, a profession that has you out in the sunshine an awful lot, um, surveying can be extremely rewarding and very profitable. And uh, well, yeah, because you, you're essentially along for the ride. I mean, I've I've been hired on to be the captain for a sea trial where the surveyor and the the broker and the client come on board yep. and for whatever reason they just needed a licensed captain to go and take the boat i hire people I, like that all the time yeah i watched this guy the surveyor get on board that thing and we didn't even make it off the dock before he was like whoa, whoa, whoa there, there, there's an issue here that you know this isn't gonna be we're not you know and found problems with the engine immediately yep. i mean the guy was like a some sort of ferret going around this boat and he just knew everything. Yeah. And, and, you know, you can, you can get various certifications for, for surveyors. Uh, there's two or three different, uh, there's Sam's, there's a couple others and there's various schools for it. Uh, Iris up in Newport gives training for surveying and Annapolis, uh, uh, uh sailing school and seamanship down in Annapolis does mm -hmm. it. And, 
you know, and then typically a, a, a surveyor will apprentice, a new surveyor will apprentice with another surveyor. With oh, a, okay, with a more, yeah, yeah. And, you know, done right, uh, you know, a person can work three work three weeks out of the month, take the other week off, and make a ton of money. And, oh, I'll bet, yeah. And and you know, you're out in the sun. Now, granted, you're on you know, you're sort of on your knees uh, in the bilges of boats sometimes, and boats that you yeah, but you're not clean in the you're bilge. You're just looking at you're it. You're just looking at it, <laughs> tapping on it with yeah, a little you're hammer. Tapping, you're tapping on it with, <laughs> a, with a phenolic hammer, it's right? And uh, it it it's you know, it can be really rewarding for somebody who you know doesn't want a desk job, who doesn't want to you know have too much stress in their lives and all they all they have to I mean most of the, most of the reports are fairly formulaic it's you're plugging in the details that you saw yeah, that you saw yeah. that day and right. and, uh, and then you know having some discussions with a potential buyer about whether a boat is uh, you know worthy of vessel acceptance yeah and if it isn't then you you, you know they'll usually revert to the broker for the um, estimates on what something might cost a surveyor should not be put, ever put in a position to do that yeah because um, they're just there to inform yeah give what they think they see yeah and the rest of it's like all up to the yeah, yeah. and there's plenty of um you know there's i shouldn't say plenty there's a handful of surveyors that are what you know what are called in the industry go-to surveyors on the short list mm -hmm. that if you're on the buy side of a deal you want that surveyor, <laughs> yeah. You, you yeah. definitely want that surveyor because you know they're gonna they're gonna do right by the client, and yeah. you know that they're they're not gonna you know put their hair on fire either. I mean, a lot of plus see a lot of surveyors are like, oh, that's just that's all wrong. That's not gonna work. That's not gonna get on the boat, and they're like, no, no that's not. But there are plenty that get on the boat and say, okay, we do have a little problem here. Let's talk through this. This is a you know a bad elbow on the on the uh, exhaust on the on the engine, and uh, you can see the smoke coming out of it. You yeah, know, that's not... <laughs> you know, you can, or if you push the elbow, you can almost put your finger through. Yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, right. Typical Yanmar issue. No, <laughs> 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 saw this yesterday. Uh, <laughs> oh, but but uh, yeah, you can. That's that's something that you know for. For people, you know, I don't want to say kids, but young adults who are, uh, you know, active racing sailors in college and are looking for something to do afterwards, it's fairly rewarding, something they might want to, I'd, I'd love to see, you know, an infusion of young blood into the hmm. uh, sort of the yacht brokerage and um, and surveying business. We just uh, hired a broker here, 24 years old, uh, you know, two years out of college, and you don't see a lot of that anymore. And yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I know that one of our competitors, I shouldn't say con competitors, but a sister brokerage down in, uh, that we work a lot with down in Annapolis, just hired two that were, you know, fresh out of college. It's nice to finally see that. You haven't seen that in a long time. And, and you know, they're, they see the, the rewards of, you know, a, a business that is, you know, if, if you're an active boater and sailor and cruising sailor, or racing sailor, or power boater, whatever, you can get into it and, and enjoy and be, be profitable at uh, fairly quickly. It's surprising to me, actually. Someone, um, someone you and I know very well who worked at uh, Bitter End for many, many years, um, you know, Mike came, Porter? Huh? No, well, he's, yeah, he's, he's, he's up there in Newport. He, he does, he does great. have him on the show at he, some point. He does too, great. Yeah. He does yeah. great. But there's someone else who, who, you know, had worked at Bid Run many, many years ago, too. Uh, and I won't name names because, because he probably wouldn't want it said that he was sort of looking in, in, yeah, in, no in this, yeah. in, 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 that, good anonymity thing. in that area is good. You know, Porter's already in the business, but this is someone oh, yeah, who yeah, was yeah. looking to be in the, looking to be, maybe be in the business. And he was startled to, to hear what the, you know, possible, you know, revenue can be from it. Yeah. It's like, yeah. It's like really? I was like, yeah, that's, that's on a bad day. <laughs> nice. So, nice. so it, it, you so know, there's incentives to it for sure. Yeah, there, there is. And it, it, it's, you know, if you like being out in the sun, you like being on boats, you like, you know, talking to people. Part of it is, is, you know, being out there and wanting to interact with people and coming out a bitter end that was, uh, I mean, you were talking to people twenty four seven, and and you, you enjoyed it. I think. Oh uh, yeah, absolutely. You know, and, and you can't you can't be in hospitality, and not 
enjoy talking to people. People, yeah. You know, That's what it, it all comes down to, right? Yeah, and and the boating industry is a lot of that as well. Granted, you know, the mechanic side of things, the fiberglass side of things, not so much, but the. Um, no, that's usually swearing and uh, a lot of anger. Yeah, um, I've gosh. done quite a bit of that these days up in Maine as well. So. Yeah, ex- exactly. But it's still fun too. It's an integral part of the whole thing. Yeah, know? yeah, yeah. But, yeah. So that that's sort of the yeah you know, been been my experience with um, with you know yacht brokerage and uh, you know the transition was was fairly seamless and I, but I look forward to seeing you know my former bitter end colleagues down at uh, the Annapolis show. I know I, I'm gonna be down there as well so we'll, we'll will you yeah, yeah I think uh, so I think uh, I once I finish this thing on the uh, well when is it is it it's this weekend a week from yeah a week from the day yeah. it starts a week so, from so, today so it, it's Thursday Friday Saturday Sunday yeah next week. yeah yeah that's the plan is to get down there at least for a couple of days on it um I think we're gonna you know I'll probably be there at the Rambler you know and uh, I think nice. I've got a I, because I'm on sort of the speaking thing and I got a lot of books with me we'll probably do some signing stuff like that nice I was but, uh, I was talking to uh, a, another bitter end blast from the past just this very morning Nick Trotter Oh, I, was, I hadn't yes. talked to him in probably a year. Yeah, and uh, a need to speak to him came up this morning, and rang him up, and he's like, "I'll be there next week too." Oh, nice. So oh, we'll have a little uh, reunion. Uh, hopefully, there. there's an opportunity for a uh, a photo op and a and a nice cold frosty beverage. Yeah, uh, you still it, drink the uh, ice cold green the beers? Green, yes, yes, the green beers. The Heinekens uh, go down way too smoothly. So, <laughs> life of a sailor. <laughs> I know. I know. Well, well, John, thank. I mean, believe it or not, we've we're at like an hour and fifteen minutes. Wow. It goes by fast. It goes it? by fast. Yeah, yeah no, it's, it was a lot of fun. I enjoyed it. Thank you for yeah. for coming on the show. And yeah, Thanks. and uh, yeah, I, I would think we're we're really blessed here to just have you sort of share some of your lifetime of experience. Not by any means you're an old man by any means but you do have a lifetime of experience in this industry and a passion for sailing that i i think has has helped inspire me and you know teach me i mean essentially down a bitter end when it came to the races all the big ones you were always the mentor and i i remember that that one instance where we had some private regatta they were doing them all over the world they chose bitter end one year and and they were like jerome yeah you can do this and i was like not without john (sighs) And I have, you I have pictures of down. you and I. I have pictures of you and I. I was just looking at them like a week or so ago, standing on the uh, the deck of Ponce de Leon, and oh, yes. I think Quinto might have been on the boat with us. And we were just we were you, we were looking upwind. I still have these pictures where you had a flag, and we were looking upwind, or you were or it was across the starting line. I can't remember which. I'd have to go back and dig them out. But just looking at them the other day, and yeah. that that very event that year, it was the. Uh, the Barrister's Cup or something, something like, like that. that. It was like yeah, a lawyer, a yeah. bunch of lawyers from all over the globe that uh, they do the event in various different places. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, no, that was that was always... And the, the pro-ams were always a pleasure, always fun. I know that... Super there, there, stressful. There was super... <laughs> the, the for, le- for me, I think you... Uh, unless you're one of those guys that's like a duck on a pond where, you know, above ground, above the water, you look fine, down but below. But the legs are doing that. Yeah, yeah, I think I just looked like I was a maniac the whole time, but... You know, there was... There was a saying, you know, that you and I used to share. I think uh, occasionally over a over a nice cold frosty beverage, and that was it takes a lot of work to make things look easy. Yeah, that's yeah, a yeah. hospitality saying that's so true, and that was the way Bitter End was. That's the way it functioned. That's the way you function. That's the way I function. You know, a lot. No one knew you know, were other than me that you were going out and let dropping marks before anyone even had breakfast. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it was, uh, everything morning. was la- everything was out laid out <laughs> out there, and I'd I'd wake up and I'd look out and I'd go, yay. <laughs> <laughs> that was my job my job was to make your job easy and uh i don't know i think it we pulled done, it off for all those years couldn't, so i appreciate couldn't have done it. it without you and there was always that catharsis right at the end of the the awards party where oh where we put down the microphone yeah and it'd be like oh, the weight of the world off the shoulders absolutely <laughs> i and i i could still remember you know that would be as much as i enjoyed all of it um you know it is pretty stressful there's a lot of stuff but I would I would project myself to that moment when that last award went out, yeah. and, then, and then it was sort of like we did it. And... Mic drop. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. All right, well, All right, well, well thank you, John, for coming of, on. A lot and... of fun, a lot of fun. We'll Till next you, time. See you in Annapolis. I'll see you in Annapolis. <laughs>